now that we're done discussing about the first type of reaction mechanism for Rx compounds, which is nucleophilic substitution, let's go to the second general type of reaction mechanism, and that is elimination, specifically beta elimination, and we've explained why we call it as such previously. Now, in, el now in elimination, instead of a nucleophile, the reagent that we're going to use for our, uh, for our reaction is a base. Alright? And so this base would be able to swipe away a hydrogen from the beta carbon. That's why this is called beta elimination. Just like in nucleophilic substitution, there are two types based on a mo molecularity. That is E1 and that is E2. Just like in SN1, E1 here is a two-step process wherein the first and rate determining step is the leaving group leaving and then the base attacks. Meaning that the base cannot attack unless the leaving group leaves. That's why we have here a weak base and uh, since we need the carbon where the leaving group has left, we need it to be stable. We need here a stable substrate, specifically the alpha carbon. In E2, just the opposite, but just like in SN2, we use a strong reagent. This time we use a strong base, and uh, here the reaction allows for the substrate to be unstable. Now, let's try to draw this in order to see more how this works. Let's draw first E1, and since I'm going to draw E1, I'm going to draw a stable alpha carbon. Let's say that I'm uh, referring here as the alpha carbon. And uh, of course, the leaving group should be directly attached to the alpha carbon. Now, just like I said, the leaving group leaves first in E1. Then what happens is that the carbon here now becomes positively charged because the leaving group of course possesses the electrons when it has left now this is the time where in the base can already attack can already attack the beta hydrogen this is the beta carbon this is a beta hydrogen the base wipes away the hydrogen so the hydrogen also goes away all right what happens to this one between hydrogen and carbon carbon wins the battle for electrons it becomes negative we have here a negative charge a positive charge in order to cancel that out we now form a double bond that's it now for E2 let's try to draw a less stable R alpha carbon so here we only have two H's around it leaving group here just like in SN2 the base or the reagent is strong enough that it has it does not have to wait for the leaving group to leave before it attacks the beta hydrogen now at the same time as the base attacks the beta hydrogen the leaving group is forced to leave and uh, immediately we are left with the alkene product and so we see in both cases of elimination that the end product of the reaction is always an alkene because from this we have seen the formation of an additional bond a pi bond that is now we're done discussing both substitution that is we're both done with nucleophilic substitution and elimination now there is something more to just the reactions there is something more than just the stereochemistry that is having the optical isomers and the R and S enantiomers we could actually combine both principles to come up with a certain property or discussion of Rx compounds known as reaction stereochemistry.
so here we're actually dealing with seeing if a certain compound becomes the same uh, isomerism after a reaction or not that is our question should be would be here in case of nucleophilic substitution huh in case of nucleophilic substitution if we have a starting material that is S after the reaction will it remain S will it become R or will it be a mixture of S and R because we know that an isomer could interchange by a rearrangement reaction into another but in this case the rearrangement reaction could actually be also the substitution reaction let's try to see what I'm talking about here here I'm going to draw a tetrahedral compound say this is R1 this is R2 this is uh, R4 and the uh, I'll draw here a leaving group which is designated as 3 uh, meaning that in the can angle prelog rules if we try to to determine whether this is S or R we start from 1 rotating to the uh, counterclockwise direction and if it's counterclockwise this is of the S alright now in SN1 let's have here for example SN1 there is a formation of a carbocation right so what happened is that the leaving group leaves and then r4 is at the back l3 here is at the front right portion if the front right portion becomes vacant this one will occupy this position and so by that case r4 will move to the front and uh, still we see that uh, the direction of the uh, substituents gives us an S uh, stereochemistry so here we have here the carbocate ion let's have a positive charge here here we see that there is actually a formation of a certain kind of triangle here if you recall in general chemistry that is what you call the trigonal planar but generally we have here a planar geometry it only has length and width unlike here this is three-dimensional this is two-dimensional this is just like a flat piece of paper so what does that give us so if we look further if we analyze it further let's have here R2 R4 and R1 there is a portion between R2 and R4 at the front so let's look at uh, this portion this is the part between R2 and R4 that is facing the front and then there's a part between R2 and R4 at the back alright now let's try to uh, transpose that into a certain kind of reaction let's have this alright let's have this I just moved my electric fan. Now, let's have this undergo a reaction. Let's say that since we're talking about nucleophilic substitution, I have here a nucleophile. The nucleophile can attack either the front portion between R2 and R4 or the back portion between R2 and R4. So, uh, what, what can we do to demonstrate that? Well, I'll try to draw two arrows here. Alright. Now, here at this arrow let's say the nucleophile attacks the back and here at the other arrow the nucleophile attacks the front and uh, since the leaving group has the three let's say that the nucleophile also has the three here now remember that here we have the S isomerism alright let's go first at the front so let's say the nucleophile attacks the front. If the nucleophile attacks the front, what happens? R4 or R2 will be pushed at the back. For uniformity's sake, let's say that the R4 would be the one that would be pushed backward in order to give way for the nucleophile. So let's draw that. Again, R2 and R1 will not move. The nucleophile will push R4 to the back because now the nucleophile will occupy the front left portion 
if we look at the sequence it's also counterclockwise giving us the S isomer again in in this case the stereochemistry of the reaction wherein we have the same optical isomer this is called as retention simply because the S has been retained, um, retained to the S isomer nothing changed but if we attack the back what happens if the nucleophile attacks the back will R4 be moved? No. Since the nucleophile will attack at the back, R4 will remain in front. And let's try to draw that here. R1, R2. This was 2D. Now this becomes 3D. So R4 will be further pushed forward. It will now become a wedge instead of just being a flat line. And the nucleophile will assume the position at the back. Alright. Um, let's already remove this first. Let's remove this first. We'll, re we'll take that back later. We cannot have the sequence here. We cannot have uh, the determination of R or S here because the R f the 4 is at the front. We have to rotate this. If we try to rotate that, what will happen is that R4 goes here. Nucleophile goes at this part. And R2 will go at the front part. Now what happens is that, look at this, 1, 2, 3, it now becomes count, no, now it becomes clockwise, I mean, and it will now assume the R isomer from the S. We have now assumed the R. There is a reversal of the isomerism, and in that case, we will call this reaction stereochemistry as inversion inversion because there is an inversion from the S to the R or R to the S alright so if we go back to the question S to S this is retention and S to R this is inversion now I actually gave out this kind of question because this actually happens remember in SN only SN1 will give this carbocation. In SN2, the carbocation really does not exist. Alright? So, meaning, this is the case only if we have an SN1. SN1 only. Wherein we have a mixture of inversion and retention. Now, this search has actually given out that there is actually a kind of 50% division, 50-50 division between the back and front attack giving us a 50-50% inversion to retention ratio or 1 is to 1. If that is the case, there is a certain term called to that. So that term is actually known as racemization. So when you say we have racemates of a compound after a reaction, it means that you have a combination of its S and R optical isomers or enantiomers. And this happens in SN1. Let's complete the letter S here. So meaning in SN1 we have racemization. Now, what if we are going to talk about SN2? Because in SN2 we are only given the certain compound here. Uh, Alright, R4, then let's draw again the leaving group, assign it with 3. Now, recall that here we have a partial positive charge for this carbon here, the alpha carbon, and a partial negative charge for the leaving group. Now, if nucleophile here attacks the carbon here, do you think nucleophile will go to the part where in the leaving group is near? Well, the leaving group here is kind of negative. The nucleophile is kind of negative. If nucleophile goes near the leaving group, they will repel because they are of the same charges. What's the nucleophile's only option? The nucleophile could attack the carbon, since anyway this is partially positive, at the site, at the part totally opposite to this one. And when you mean totally opposite, it's as if it's at the other side. So meaning, if this is 
the front part, this is the back part. Meaning this is where nucleophile will attack in order to attract carbon more and that will then force the living group to go away. This is kind of a, what you say, a back attack mechanism. So, j you know, just like in real life, you don't want your enemy to see you, you just attack them from the back, you know, some kind of backstabbing going on in order to get what you want or in order to get who you want, whatever. Now, what happens is, of course, living group will leave, but here, what happens is the nucleophile will assume the back part, but then again, R4 is at the back, right? This means that if nucleophile assumes the back position, R4 will be pushed to the front. So R4 will be pushed to the front. And then the nucleophile will assume the back part with R2 and R1 being unchanged. And so look at this. Let's try to draw the stereochemistry of this. This is 1, 2, 3. This is, uh, how do you counterclockwise? This is of the S isomerism. How about this one? Well, we have the F R4 again here. We have to convert this again. So R1 remains here. Carbon goes here. Nucleophile goes here. This is number 3. Okay. Then R4 goes at the back. Then R2 assumes the front position. So 1, 2, 3. So you can see it's now going clockwise. We have an R isomers from S to R. So this is what happens in S and 2. This is 100% uh, uh, S to R or R to S. That is inversion. So meaning we can now conclude that as long as you have an SN1 reaction, you have a racemization stereochemistry. And for SN2, you will always have a 100% inversion stereochemistry.